Hi, everyone who is waiting um, for the webinar to start. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. I'm really, really excited to share some cool case studies that our clients have um, brought to the table today. We've got a ton of really great Q&A, some really cool, interesting use cases um, using Banwingo's platform to share with you guys and two wonderful presenters who have joined me today. We're going to give a little bit of time to everyone who's still logging in today. Um, thank you guys so much for coming back from Thanksgiving and being ready to learn. Um, hopefully you all had a wonderful holiday um, and you know you are plenty stuffed and ready to just finish out this year strong. We have um, an upcoming webinar on December 7th where we're, uh, we're going to talk road mapping. So if you haven't thought about what passports you're going to launch next year, um, this road mapping webinar is going to give you a really cool worksheet to go through internal brainstorming with your team um, and just moving forward some really interesting different ways to approach a new passport build. So feel free to tune in. Um, registration is live now. and We actually sent it out in our newsletter earlier today, but you can also always find um, our webinars on social media. We're on LinkedIn and Facebook, so you can find those um, webinars there and register for them. Um, just a reminder to everyone, this webinar will be recorded and shared on bandwingo.com in our resources section. So moving forward, if you ever want to find it again or want to find some of our past webinars to access, you can find those on bandwingo.com. So um, just a few different places that you can find some resources and something really exciting to look forward to on December 7th in our road mapping webinar. Um, that's going to be hosted by myself, Ashley McKinney, um, and Cody Chomiak. So uh, we're going to have a really good time and hopefully give you guys something to think about then. But um, shifting to today, the main attraction, thank you guys so much for joining us for this paid tasting passports case study webinar. Um, we are joined today by Lynette Bain, who is the Vice President of Destination Development for Tourism Windsor Essex, and Christina Recklaw, the Executive Director of Visit Corvallis. Um, and they have both put together a few slides to share with the group to talk about what their passports are, how they're built and managed. Um, and then we've got some really fun Q&A to kind of go through at the end. So feel free to get involved um, during the webinar. You can always um, post your own questions or comments in the chat, um, which you should see on your screen or in the Q&A section. Um, so uh, we have all the time in the world to answer those questions for you guys. So again, feel free to use those resources and um, we're excited to kind of jump in today and share a little bit more with you guys. So make sure you get the most out of it. Feel free to um, use that chat or that Q&A. Um, all right, so enough of me talking, but uh, before we kind of pitch it over to our guests, just in case you don't know me, I am um, Emily Harris, the Director of Marketing Operations for Banwango. I get to work with a lot of our current clients on ways to maximize their impact with their current passports. So to all of my client friends out there, hello, it's so good to see you guys. Um, and I also work with our sales team um, to uh, help any new people who are interested in Banwango learn more about our product and ways they can leverage um, our technology to build really interesting things in their destination. So if that's you, welcome. I hope that you get so much inspiration out of today. If you want to contact me after um, the webinar, you can always reach me at emily at banwango.com. Just make sure you spell it right because it's a little weird, um, but always happy to chat and bounce ideas around. Okay, so we're going to kick it off with Lynette. Um, Lynette, uh, feel free to introduce yourself and your destination a little bit. Sure. Um, my name is Lynette Bain, and I head up the team of destination development for tourism Windsor Essex, Peely Island. And we're in Canada, so uh, I, I, that's why Emily's making me go first because I didn't stuff my face all weekend with turkey, so she thought I might be uh, ready for the challenge and. Uh, 
But uh, yeah, in Canada, our our um, Thanksgiving is in October, so all our focus can be on uh, the holiday season coming up in in December. But uh, so we actually are the southernmost point in Canada. So we're as far south as you can go in Canada. We're actually even south of Detroit. Um, so many don't know that that we kind of just circle under Detroit and so we are about four hours uh, west of Toronto southwest of Toronto so we have a some nice urban areas close by with Detroit uh, major cities in Ohio Toledo Cleveland and Toronto being all within three and a half four hours driving and our our location um, where we sit we're on the 42nd parallel so that's actually some of the same parallels that you'll see in, in Rome, Northern California, parts of Bordeaux, France. So we have a, an ideal climate for grape growing. And being that we're surrounded by water, we're a peninsula, uh, it provides nice lake breezes uh, for a nice climate. And the, sa the soil, we do have a lot of uh, sandy loam, which is awesome for drainage. Uh, some pesky clay, but uh, our winemakers are, are able to make the best of it. And we also have an island in the middle of Lake Erie that's really well known called Keeley Island for growing grapes. And that's actually where the first winery in Canada was. The first commercial winery was, was on Keeley Island, and it dates back to the 1860s. So a lot of great history. So currently we have um, 19 wineries in our region. Um, it's one of the smaller wine regions in Canada, but uh, we are mighty. And uh, the association is called EPIC. It's the Essex Keeley Island Coast Wine Growers Association. And uh, we work with them at Tourism Windsor Essex to help promote them. And um, this is where the tasting pass comes in that we find it a great way to promote our amazing wine country in the deep south of Canada. So to get a little bit of perspective of um, the lay of the land, I think uh, Emily's going to play a video that will give you a little snack, snippet of the wine region. This is where we hope the technology works. <laughs> and do I have to act, do you want me to act it out or no, we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. This is real time people. <laughs> You can't make this up. But anyways, uh, while Emily's pull, pulling that together, uh, hopefully we can show it, but this is a short video. Um, the Wine and Growers Association, uh, they have a, a marketing committee and they have a board and, and I advise them and, you know, we've, oh, look, we've got it there. Wonderful. Yay. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Wind it back. All right, so that was just a nice, quick, short video just to make sure everyone's awake and, and enjoying and, and thinking about drinking wine. You know, coming up to the holiday season, it's uh, going to be a very popular drink on our tables, and I'm sure it was uh, over Thanksgiving. But, you know, the idea of wine tasting passports is not new, obviously, and it's not new to our wine region either. We actually won an Ontario Culinary Tourism Award in 2014. 2015 for our program we had you can see in the top left there the passport to epic wine country it was actually a physical uh booklet and uh it was ten dollars to buy and you got uh tastings there was discounts at restaurants and when you when i look back i'm like wow that was a lot of work for ten dollars and uh printing costs but we sold a lot of those suckers and they floated around forever um and we knew we had to evolve so in in 2017 uh, we explored our first digital tasting pass, and um, you'll see that on the screen. It was Explore, Taste, and Save, and it was $25. We took a step up, and uh, but it was pretty um, cumbersome. There was uh, the tickets 
were not very flexible. Um, we couldn't share the revenue with uh, the wineries. Everything went back to the association and we didn't really have um, good tracking. So we evolved to working with Van Wangle, and that's our past that you see now. And we, uh, we're getting there. Um, it's a very price sensitive market, I will tell you that, uh, where we're located. Um, and we were really pushing it with this one. Um, eight wine tastings for $50. And working with Van Wango, um, you know, I really was urging the wineries to, uh, to, to venture back into passports because during COVID, we paused the program. And uh, when we were out of lockdown, and we had many of those here in Ontario, um, the wineries knew they were going to be really busy, and they weren't fond of the idea of offering discounts. Uh, so it was, it was a pretty tough sell to get them on board with relaunching a new passport program. But I explained that Bandwango was different, and uh, it took a lot of coaxing, but um, the fact that the wineries were able to um, get a redemption back, get some dollars back so that the passport wasn't a cost center. And uh, that's what the passports and tasting passes had become. Uh, with more work, you have people coming in, uh, you've got to make sure you have staff for it, and then you're giving away the tastings. So now with the uh, the setup that we have, uh, they're a lot happier, and uh, they're really loving the ease of use for this pass. Uh, there's nothing that their staff need to download. Uh, we don't have to worry about them using their phones, which is what our, our prior system was. Um, it's it's super easy, and the and the customers seem to to really like it. Um, we didn't really use any gamification for this pass at this time. Um, I was happy to be able to get the wineries to sign on to this, and now uh, in speaking with the uh, the executive from the board, they seem more open um, to wanting to uh, try different things now that they've seen some of the results that we're having. And uh, the setup that we have is the wineries get, I believe it's uh, $3 back for each tasting. And it's only if they actually redeem the tasting. So there is opportunity for the association to to make more, uh, but the rest goes back into the association for their marketing purposes. And uh, it really helps a small association stay sustainable. Stay sustainable. Um, I'm sure you've all seen the screen. I don't even know why I included it, but I think maybe just trying to fill slides. I, I think uh, Christine and I had a contest to see who would have more slides, so I, I wanted to make sure I beat her. So. We'll skip that one. <laughs> and Emily's going to like this part because it's about collateral. And you, you have to, and I'm sure you all know this, when you're launching a pass, you've got to have a good plan. So it's like any marketing program that you have. You have to have a distribution plan. You've got to understand how to get the message into people's hands, to their screens. Um, so little things like uh, these rack cards that we use um, at our visitor centers, at our community activations, and at the wineries. Um, to encourage the use of the pass. Um, also really important was to onboard our wineries. So we created a little video for them, uh, created participant instructions. Um, now, the wine, when I've done other passes, I've done a little bit more um, onboarding, but the wineries were already pretty familiar with how to operate a tasting pass. So it was a pretty easy transition for them and they didn't need a lot of handholding, but um, you've got to make sure you look professional when you're presenting yourself to the to your stakeholders um, with some kind of branded instructions and a whole rollout kit for them. We also did these cool lawn signs for the wineries, um, and it looks really great at the entrance of the wineries when they see these signs that to stop here um, and redeem your tasting pass. Consumers love it when they're on a trail to be able to see some confirmation. Okay, I'm in the right spot. Here, this is what I'm looking for. I've arrived, and uh, the, the wineries like them as well. Another way that we have been promoting this new tasting pass was with our holiday gift guide this year. Um, we promoted the sale of both our beer and wine tasting passes in our holiday gift guide, which had a, a pretty aggressive uh, both print and digital campaign. Um, and we've been seeing some amazing results and returns coming from incorporating that. So the lesson here is making sure you're incorporating your tasting pass into your branded campaigns. Um, you don't always just have to run an exclusive campaign. It can be integrated into whatever you're doing and, and partnering with somebody else um, just to leverage 
uh, you know, our shrinking advertising budgets to, to get more bang for your buck. And the Tasting Pass also inspired our wineries to work together to create a gift box for the holidays. And this is our Making Spirits Bright holiday box featuring 13 wineries, uh, participating wineries in the association. And we had different op opportunities for people to purchase a full case or just reds or just whites or a surprise mystery pack. So um, it's a great way to think of gift giving um, when people can one-stop shop and get a taste of all their favorite wineries and uh, a wine winery tasting pack. Okay, well look, I'm already speaking into Christina's. I shouldn't do that, I'll back up. So wait, Christina, I think you won the challenge. If there's 19 total slides, I only had nine, you win. So I'm gonna have to send you um, one of our tasting passes so you can come and visit us. <laughs> I will be looking forward to that. Actually, what I really wanted to see was with the video, if you would have done an interpretive dance of your yes. video. Like, well, that would I do awesome. have some wine standing by. So that if I needed to pour myself a glass, I could recreate the scene of pouring the wine into the glass. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, um, I'll go, I can go over a, a, a couple of items from the past for the folks. If any, I hope people have signed on. I'm not sure if I, I know my team, Lionel and Jessica are both signed on. So we would have at least have two people. So hi, Lionel. Hi, Jess. And, um, you know, uh, the team is so amazing with launching these passes because you know normally we've launched I think three prior to the wine tasting pass and our team did all the outreach to the stakeholders because it was so new and you know especially during COVID we were really um, kind of kid gloving our stakeholder relations and wanting to make sure those uh, relationships were strong and reinforcing that so we did a lot of um, outreach and follow-up and door-to-door -door even with some of our uh, passes um, to make sure that we got the best participation we possibly could um, but some of the results I mean we didn't launch this wine tasting pass until early October um, I think this is good I was really happy with the results but we sold about three thousand dollars so far so I was Pretty, pretty happy about that. Um, so that's returning about $1,500 to the association um, already in, in just you know two months. So uh, they're pretty excited about the prospects for more um, opportunities in, in the new year. Um, and I know we're going to get into some of the Q&A later about what, what we're going to be doing next. But I will say a sneak that are like just laying the cat out of the bag a little bit. We're going to be venturing with more passports. Um, we're going to have a rosé all day passport and a sparkling sampler. So uh, more, the, this pass we have now is good for 365 days. I'm sorry about the sunlight here, but you know, we're in south, we're in the south of Canada, so we have a lot of sunlight. Um, but these ones are going to be more short, like 24 hours or 36 hours. So uh, we're not holding that liability out there of the tasting. So um, we're excited to try those new passes and um, even for events as well. So we do have a really popular event called March Maxness, and it's all about wine and mac and cheese, and we're gonna be using Bandwango for an event. So instead of March Madness, we have March Maxness here, and uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun with that pass and, and uh, hopefully getting some really great sales. There was a question about our holiday packs, and uh, no, we don't sell those through Bandwango. We, um, that would be great. So Emily, take note, maybe talk to your developers and, and see an e-commerce piece there because in Canada, for sure, our liquor laws are a little archaic from 1920 and really haven't been many updates. So uh, we're, the pandemic has allowed for a little bit more flexibility, but we are working through our largest winery uh, who has a different license to sell the variety packs. So we have a lot of restrictions and red tape around that that we're hoping we can ease in the coming year. Awesome, thank you so much for that overview, Lynette. Um, we're definitely gonna get into some Q&A with you later. And for anybody who is wondering about these kind of like packs, um, Banwingo does work with a few of our clients to sell merchandise. Um, if you're interested in that option, um, we can try to figure out if there's um, if it's the right synergy in regards to regulations. Like Lynette said, a lot of times with um, 
alcohol, there's red tape to jump through. But if you're interested in that option and you are a current client, feel free to reach out to your client success manager to ask more questions about that. And if you're a prospect, feel free to reach out to one of our sales directors um, who can tell you a little bit more about the clients who we do work with um, in regards to that. So next up, Christina um, is near and dear to my heart. This case study was one of the first uh, passports that I worked on here at Van Wango. So I'm so excited for you to share a little bit about Corvallis and about um, your Willamette uh, Winery Association that you guys work so closely with. So feel free to take it away. All right. So I am Christina Reckla. I am the executive director for Visit Corvallis. Uh, so we are on the other side of the country from the case study that you just heard. We are out in Oregon um, in the Willamette Valley. Uh, the Willamette Valley has a fairly robust um, reputation, especially in Pinot Noir. Um, we have around about 600 wineries, I believe, in the entire valley. Um, I will say Corvallis tends to sit in the middle of the valley. Um, the valley is about, I think, around 100 miles from north to south, as we define it from a tourism perspective. Uh, the area that I represent uh, is not uh, where the most of the concentration of the wineries are at. That's actually in the northern part of the valley. Um, we have a, a smaller uh, amount of wineries in our area. The other thing about Corvallis that you may know Corvallis from is we are the home of Oregon State University. Um, and that is something uh, that we are definitely a college town as approximately half of our population is made up of OSU students. Uh, so the other thing about our valley is um, we tend to have a very rich agricultural history. Um, Oregon State uh, has some of the leading programs in agri agriculture as well as forestry. So it's all about booze and trees in our area and beavers as well as that is uh, Oregon State's uh, mascot. So um, today we're just going to talk a little bit about our passport, which is for the heart of the Willamette Wineries Association. Um, but I'm going to start out with first with my relationship with Bandwango, uh, because I've had a relationship. We have worked together, I think, since 2019. Um, and so I get asked a lot, uh, well, why did you pick Bandwango? And for me, uh, we are a small DMO. Uh, we have a total of, of, we're a mighty army of four with less than a million dollar budget to do everything that we need to do. And what initially caused me to reach out to Van Wango was not even this pass. It was uh, a request from our conference services uh, partner who wanted to offer one of those show your badge type of programs, a savings program. And I had not even been at Visit Corvallis for a total of like a year. And we had a lot going on uh, just with me being new to the state, to the organization. And I realized I would just never have the capacity. So for me, one of the things that I really appreciate by using Bandwango is just that I feel like I can expand my team. I can turn them over once we've made some introductions. Um, I don't have a membership engagement person. That would be me on top of my other duties as executive director. So I really appreciate being able to turn that over and help feel like I have a good partner to help me wrangle all the cats that I have to wrangle in a day. As far as this particular passport that we're talking about today, the, one of the main reasons I picked Bandwango was just ROI. One of the first uh, meetings that I went to when I got to visit Corvallis was an association meeting with the what we call the heart of Willamette Winery Association, or we affectionately call them HOW. And they were talking about this passport program that they had and all of their questions, they spent probably at least 35 minutes, 40 minutes on 
they could tell how many passports they sold, but they had no idea what the ROI was on it. They had no idea how much people were redeeming them um, beyond just doing the sales um, from that particular program. So a little history about uh, this passport program for the Winery Association. So this is their main uh, fundraising uh, program that they have, and they use it just as the other case study to do marketing and things of that nature. Uh, the passport was originally kicked off in 2015, um, and it was not sold online at all. Um, it was sold at the physical location of the wineries. Um, I will say the wineries do a great job of, they had their collateral. If you walk in, like, you know, Emily, they would do you proud. They have their promotion, like that piece down. Um, and then we also sold it physically at the visitor center. Um, when I first got into Bandwango, uh, we had started in 2019, we had kicked off with that. Uh, savings pass, I'm going to call it for conference people. But in the back of my mind, I had always thought this would be a great program for that winery passport. And so in late 2019 is when I had a conversation with both Van Wango and the association. And we had an initial kickoff call, I think in January of 2020. Now, when I think back now, looking at this case study, I had no idea what was going to be hitting in March um, from that particular perspective. Um, and so I was really thankful that we did make that switch over to 2020 because in April of 2020, we closed our visitor center, the physical thing, and we did not reopen until June of 2021 um, from that particular perspective. So. One thing that I was really appreciative of is though, even though we were putting pause on a lot of different things, I really appreciated the team at Bandwango being able to work directly with the association to get that launched because it freed up capacity for me to be doing what we had to do to support our partners as they were going through the shutdowns to do that communication of the constant changes. So that to me was like a big thing for me as far as uh, help. So what's on our passport? Um, we are similar size to the passport that you just heard about. Uh, we have 17 wineries on here. It's a combination of different flights, discounts. Um, we have been selling our passport for the last several years for $30 for over um, $100 worth of offers uh, from that particular perspective. And here's a picture of what it looks like when you see it on the pass. Um, as far as, again, when we launched this, we launched it in May of 2020. Um, and that's a big month here in Oregon for wine because that is the Oregon Wine Month um, from that particular uh, perspective. Um, from the place of the promotion, um, in 2020, we did not, Visa Corvallis did not use uh, pretty much any of our dollars over the entire summer of 2020 to do any type of promotion. We were getting pretty strict guidelines that we were not to be promoting travel in any shape, form, or way. So that is not a typo of the $620. Uh, that actually was the budget that the association gave Ben Wango to do a small Facebook campaign. Um, but $620, that is a lot of money to this association uh, as this is the main uh, fundraiser. So here's an example of the uh, promotion that we did uh, for, or that Bandwango did. And we did get, you know, some good numbers as far as reach. We had about 22,000 uh, people from that particular perspective. And we were somewhat in line with, um, as far as the conversion rate of the 2% uh, from that particular perspective. The other thing that um, was just always a big question was that the association just 
they could not determine like, were they actually making money or what was the redemption rate? I will never forget the meeting. Um, so we they kicked off and launched the passport in May of 2020. And I did not, um, because of everything going on, uh, finally got to meet with the association in August of 2020. And I think one of the things that I was so impressed by, uh, because I love my wineries, um, they are not exactly what I would call um, always the most tech savvy. They're, they're winemakers um, from that particular perspective. But I was very impressed when I went to that meeting that they had gone into the Bandwango uh, platform. They had their report. They had gone over their report. Uh, they could, you know, knew exactly how much as far as people doing the redemptions um, what I found surprising about this particular report is the winery that I thought would have the most trouble with the technology also has the worst Wi-Fi reception because these wineries are also getting into our coastal range. So some of them are a little off the grid from a GPS uh, perspective actually has the highest redemption rate. Uh, but she even talked uh, to me a little bit about how if somebody couldn't do the redemption there, she just simply gave them the code and they did it later. And obviously they are doing it because she has, again, one of the highest redemptions of all of the wineries uh, from that standpoint. But I will give a lot of credit as we're talking about promotion um, all of the wineries that are involved in this, and even also um, we have a cider house as well as a distillery, uh, they all have the, when you go to their uh, website, the passport is front and center, and like we have it on our landing page as well, and I think that makes a, a huge difference, um, and I would say if you're looking at doing one of these passports, make sure that you have your promotion in line even before you start on the whole platform piece of it. So for me, it's always about like, this is all nice and good and all that, but what were the actual results? So I went back, I didn't go all the way back to 2015. Uh, but as you can see, we switched over in 2020 to the passport um, and it was comparable. Like we didn't see a big dip because one of my big questions when I went to the association in August was like, how did it go from their perspective on like, was it simple? Was it clunky? How was it? Um, how did the uh, people using the passport feel like? Because this has been a pass paper passport for the last five years. It tended to be a little older audience. I just didn't know how that was going to go. So this is the first time I've ever had stakeholders gush on me. Um, I have to say they were thrilled from the perspective of they actually found that the phone passport was easier than the paper passport from their perspective. But the other part that I thought was interesting is that the consumer really liked it moving to from a paper passport to the phone passport. And I think some of the feedback was, was one, they didn't have one other thing that they had to keep track of because let's face it, we all have a special relationship with our smartphones. Uh, rarely do we leave the house without them. Uh, the other thing too, uh, that I also think, I know I liked it when I used it at a winery was this was back when we were still unsure whether paper was good or bad. So having that con, that con, uh, like having less contact, uh, was a big thing for uh, people as far as feeling more secure, feeling safe. Um, the other thing too, I think was uh, that helped, especially in making that move was everyone was having to move over to using smartphones more often. I mean, who thought that QR codes would make a comeback like they did uh, during the pandemic? So I think that really helped. Um, 
We then launched it again here in 2021. Um, I think we launched it in early April timeframe. Um, and to use a very bad pun, uh, the wineries are really crushing it. As you can see, they've doubled their sales for this particular year. Uh, for them, it's generated about 12,000-ish dollars uh, for the association, and that's significantly more than what they were having before. But even beyond uh, that particular money, um, again, I've never gone to a meeting with stakeholders that gushed upon me. The other thing, too, I really, again, appreciated about Bandwango was they were able to help uh, the association do this during a time when we were all desperately trying to figure out a way to support our businesses. So for them, it was less work. They didn't have the printing costs. Um, so they came out ahead in that particular uh, standpoint. Um, and then two, uh, for us, we always have a contract with our city council. So being able to go in with actual numbers to say, this is how we have helped our local community as far as our local businesses. It was a really good win for us. As far as the future goes, uh, we have been extending the passport. So in the past, uh, the passport was only sold from May until uh, probably close to the end of September, which caused the uh, Winery Association to miss out on Thanksgiving weekends. So here, um, sort of similar again to the case study before, uh, Thanksgiving is a huge, huge time um, to, uh, you know, for sales from that particular perspective. The other thing for us is that um, at least in 2020, we didn't have any kind of lookalike audiences that we could use for Facebook or any other things. So we're looking at uh, being able to allow Visit Corbalis to have like that particular audience that then we can do some additional pushes to um, from that standpoint. The other thing is, um, ex you know, expanding it into other channels. Um, and then finally, one thing I didn't put on here, but uh, we now have a database of people that we can recontact. So what we typically do is with our passport, it's now extended to the end of December. And now we have approximately four, over 400 people that we can ping next year when we go to sell uh, the passport to say, hey, it's ready to go. Uh, because that was something that the wineries had not had in the past. When somebody bought the pass, they took the pass and there was no data collected um, from that particular perspective. Um, as far as other passports that we're looking at um, too, we're getting ready uh, to launch uh, um, a food trail gamification type of passport. So we have a food trail of about 50 some different businesses, some of them including these wineries that we talked about, but then also a lot of farms, farm stands. And so we're using uh, that particular as that's going to be our next passport that I think I'm finally going to give Brandon the AOK -okay and give him the final like merchandise so that we can start launching that and then promoting that a lot uh, this coming year. So I see a question um, in here about what was the uh, remittance to each uh, venue per use. Um, from that particular standpoint, um, most of the uh, uh, revenue that came back um, would go directly to the association. Um, they didn't really do it per venue. Um, it was more uh, for, the, they used this as a way to promote the association and used it for marketing um, from that particular perspective. And for as far as the gamification and rewards for our food trail, so we have different uh, prizes. Um, one of the things I really, really, really liked that Bandwago has come out is with the uh, GPS targeting uh, because um, 
our farm, a lot of our agricultural tourism um, partners, um, we didn't want to put a lot of extra stress on our businesses, given everything that everyone has gone through. So um, if they uh, arrive there, there's a ping that goes back that shows that they went there. But we have things like um, we have some stickers. Uh, we are going to be doing some canvas bags as reusable bags here. Um, there's a plastic bag band um, in Oregon. Um, we do t-shirts as well as some hats. So depending on how many things that they visit, then they can collect those different things. Um, so as far as the question, it says, uh, does that mean that the wineries are donating their wine tastings if your DMO? Oh, we do not keep the full profits. Um, from the passport. Um, so the wineries are donating their tastings to their association. Um, I will say how does give us, I think um, in the past it's been a couple dollar uh, rebate, but we don't ever look at this as being something that we really bank money off of. Um, it's actually a service that we provide the association as we pick up uh, the band Wango fee um, from that standpoint. And this really is our way of supporting the smaller uh, association. Um, so the money all goes back to the association. Yeah, great questions. Um, just a reminder for everyone who's tuned in, if you have questions for our wonderful presenters, please feel free to put them into the chat box or into the Q&A um, section um, so that you can uh, ask what's on your mind. <clears throat> we have a few kind of Q&A questions to go through, but again, feel free to chime in. If you joined us halfway through, I'm just going to do kind of a quick reintroduction. Um, we're joined today by Lynette Bain, who is the Vice President of Destination Development for Tourism Windsor Essex, and Christina Recklaw, who is the Executive Director of Visit Corvallis. They are both lovely um, Van Wingo clients who have been with us and have launched paid tasting passports um, you know, with their winery associations or kind of in conjunction with some of their um, wineries in the area. And um, they talked a little bit earlier about kind of their unique case studies um, but now I uh, want to kind of jump into some Q&A. So um, Laura, one of our attendees actually asked, did you guys um, run into any alcohol laws that made your passports difficult? Um, were there any laws that offer um, that made offering discounts on wine difficult? I'll answer really quickly from the Van Wingo perspective. Every single state and district we work with is different. There are a bunch of different ways that we have um, worked with clients to kind of figure out the right way to offer these tasting passes. When we're really lucky, it's easy and we can offer those free tasting flights that are included with the purchase of the passport. Um, uh, one of our other winery clients, Woodenville Wine Association, actually offers discounts for all of their check-in locations for their tasting pass that include um, discounts on uh, their wine clubs or bottle purchases. Um, bottle purchases in particular are something that we track with that Woodenville Tasting Pass. They have a case study on our website. So if you're interested in learning more about them, feel free to find that there. But um, for you guys, Christina and Lena, did you guys run into any alcohol law concerns when building your passports? I'll start. Um, well, I really rely on the association who have the connections with um, their specific associations, like uh, we have got the Wine Growers Alliance, um, the Ontario Craft Wineries, and uh, the Alcohol and Gaming Corporation. So, you know, we stay in 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 tune with what's happening there. Um, we are regulated to how large the samples can be, so we have to do one ounce pours, um, and then even though the, the samples are included with the price and they're not being charged the client for them, um, they have to make sure that they're not, when you factor in the cost of each sample, it can't be lower than the price of the bottle at our, our LCBO retail agency. So there's a lot of different little formulas we have to do. 
Um, I mean, it's not really something that's uh, flagged or kind of um, looked at with a microscope, but we always kind of make sure it passes that, that sniff test and that our, our wineries who are more in tune with the laws um, are uh, think that it's on the up and up. But we've never had any problems and uh, we are we make sure that the person purchasing, they have to be over 19. Uh, they are obviously providing ID when necessary at uh, the wineries themselves. Uh, but it's really important that we stay on the right side of the law. We're not like a rec law or anything like that, like Christina. <laughs> we try and uh, make sure that we're uh, staying on the right side of the law and um, it, it, it works really well. And I think that as long as we're uh, communicating what we do usually with the, the, the wine association, we're, we're in the clear. And I would echo a lot of what Lynette just said. Um, in our particular case, um, one of the things I think that made it a smooth transition was there already was a passport program uh, going on. We work very closely with the winery association. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, we've been uh, very blessed in that they keep up a lot on um, the laws. Um, again, uh, living here in Oregon with uh, such an emphasis on wine, as well as uh, we're really known uh, well for our breweries as well. Because uh, like in our particular passport, um, we not only have the wineries, but we also have a spirits distiller and we have a cider house. And guess what? They all go by different rules and laws and things like that. So we really work uh, very closely with um, the partners um, and, you know, we do keep up a bit on the laws. Uh, however, we also rely a lot on our partners uh, to, uh, you know, put on something that is uh, in compliance, because uh, again, they also have their own individual reputations uh, to um, maintain. And the other thing, um, actually in a weird sort of way, one thing I kind of like about Bandwango um, as well is with the data, you can see um, how many tastings are being done. So, you know, if you are seeing something like okay, there's someone who did 10 tastings in about four hours, might need to flag that um, from that particular perspective. I will say with our passport, um, the average redemption is only like 2.5 or three uh, tastings for the entire life of the passport. So um, that's the other nice thing is I can feel good that um, we're not, over serving or we're, we don't have an issue with people just going out and doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Yeah, great answers there. I always like to tell the story. Um, I was at Visit Houston before I was here at Van Wango and I was there when Visit Houston launched their paid brew pass. And, um, you know, here at Van Wingo, we always tried to be conservative. We price things really conservatively at the beginning so that we're not, you know, um, losing our shirts or our clients aren't on any of these passes that launch. And then we can always scale back the price. But we talk a lot, um, my colleague Ashley and I, about those beginning days at um, Visit Houston, because we thought um, the one day brew pass had a total of six breweries that was included. And we were like, there's no way people are going to go to six breweries in a day. And after the first weekend, there were a handful of people who had purchased it and done exactly that. And so we came back in on Monday, like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? So we had to kind of go back to the drawing board because our redemption rate uh, was like, not anywhere close to what we thought it would be. Um, and we've learned, I think, a lot across clients now. Van Wingo's launched so many of these tasting passes in other destinations that we've like really gotten smart about our redemption models and our, our pricing models. But, um, you know, it is funny because your redemption rate is so um, indicative of the price point that you should sell it at. But also to Christina's point, you want to make sure that you can never be um, liable for over serving. Um, so good question there about like the laws um, because alcohol is. Yeah, because we want the right just... client. Yeah, yeah, we don't want the one that's going to go to 10 wineries in one day. And I think that was one of the reasons why we raised the price too. 
we're we're and we're really looking for out of market people really that are going to be new clients and that are willing to pay and that want to buy wine when they're there we don't want the the bachelorette parties um we even have a restriction on ours that they can't be used in uh like groups larger than eight and if you are in in a group larger than six you've got to make a reservation so we really aren't trying to cater to that party group Yep, that's a really good perspective. And there's so many different things that we can do here at Banwango to help kind of regulate that um, in terms of like who signs up and how. And you heard Lynette kind of talking about those guidelines. So really good questions, good answers from our um, uh, presenters here. So let me ask this. If both of you were to start your initiatives fully over is there anything that you would do differently? Or if not, what advice would you give to someone who's kind of just starting to think about building a passport with Banwingo that is focused on like paid tastings or, or kind of the wine and spirits um, part of their destination? I mean, I feel like for our first paid passport, we were pretty prepared. Um, seeing that we had launched a couple first. I mean, I'm a big fan of the paid passports. I think when people pay for something, they value it. And we've actually, I'm really happy with our results on the paid. We have another paid passport and it's our barrels, balls and brews and it's um, beer and spirits. And uh, we've had uh, similar results and we've got three different options there. And uh, I really think that um, it, it's, it's a matter of onboarding, being prepared for onboarding and having a really good plan. And uh, we had the luxury of being able to go out in person um, and be able to hand deliver these onboarding kits. So um, each uh, participating business is able to get this kit uh, and train their staff. And then we also create kits for local influencers so that they can start to create their own um, online content. So uh, one fun one, we did a Nona's shopping list and that's for our uh, Italian, our Via Italia, VIA. And it was all about uh, the Italian heritage. And we created these uh, influencer kits and it was um, all these ingredients they needed to make Nona's famous sauce. And uh, we had an apron and a wooden spoon and all the, the food items and uh, recipes and then some of the little items from stores. And uh, we got amazing free social media um, uh, like content and it, it was a really great way to go about it. So I would say when I mean, the same thing for our wine, we did um, w- bottles of wine and a whole kit out to influencers. So they created uh, videos and uh, stories, did Instagram takeovers and, and those are really successful. So I would really recommend people look at doing that. I would say um, like, for the wine passport, that actually, um, again, because they already had uh, a bit of a following um, going into it, um, that one I probably would not do a ton over again or differently. Um, however, I will say for the first passport that I did, the savings passport, that was a different story. Um, I will say um, I do like doing the paid ones. Again, Lynette, I think you hit it on the head of that there's a lot more value to someone if they're going to even pay a small fee um, from that particular perspective uh, because with um, our conference uh, savings pass, uh, that one got to to be a little bit of a hard thing um, in that you were reliant on the uh, conference partner to put some promotion into the bags um, from that particular perspective. Also, I have to say, um, like for us, if you're doing a savings passport, have it be more uh, niche than not. Um, In our particular one, um, we did a broad outreach. I will probably never do a broad outreach again uh, because we had certain partners that leaned forward um, and we didn't really want to say no, but it wasn't really a great uh, fit for them from that particular perspective. So I think really having that ideal customer in mind and what you want to accomplish it even before you do the passport. I mean, I think that's even whether you use Bandwango 
or not. Um, but I think that's something like as you're thinking about like these particular gamifications and savings to really have that ideal uh, customer in mind and then just how are you going to do the promotion piece of it so Lynette you've like raised the bar on me um, we need to be better at Visit Corvallis about giving our partners um, a kit that, to begin with but um, for us again you know one of the reasons we like to use Bandwango is just that capacity to then help onboard partners um, when I don't either have the capacity myself and don't have a staff member who can do that. Um, so I would just say like that initial outreach and then just having your promotional plan ahead of time um, that I think is, is really important. Yeah, absolutely. So we're running kind of to the final five minutes here. One last question for you both. Um, what did you learn while working with your winery association partners that you would want to share? Um, what is your relationship like with them? Or what's just one thing that you would um, tell people maybe before they go out and try to connect with their own winery or spirits association that you think would be helpful for them to know? Well, I think the picture that Christina used on her intro slide was the, says it all hurting the cats. I mean, um, I've worked with our association for about 10 years now. So we've got a really uh, tight relationship. Um, I don't know, sometimes love hate, but uh, most of the time love. Um, and I feel that they really lean on our organization for marketing. So, you know, had I tried to do this a few, like five or six years ago, it might have been a different story. But with them, um, it was pretty much just listening to the concerns, uh, which were mostly around COVID, um, and, and trying to give them solutions for it. At the end of the day, they they just want to be able to bring people to their wineries. They're concerned about really cannibalizing on their existing market already. They don't want to provide discounts to people who are already coming. So as long as I was listening to those concerns, and that's something that I really had to make sure that I got over my need to want to have a million signups or redemptions or sales and get the right ones. Um, so I had to curb that enthusiasm of mine, listen to their needs, which was getting new customers from out of market who are the right ones. Um, and then we can establish a realistic goal and, and be happy with that. So really listen to them and they're all going to have different needs, but overall you'll, you'll hear the same theme from all of them. But I think, working with an association is easier than working with individual wineries. I would agree. Um, you know, for me, it was wonderful because um, I was able to do an introduction of uh, like the Bandwango team to the person who pretty much uh, heads up the passport program and then a lot of the heavy lifting was done by those particular two individuals. Um, as far as, you know, like surprises or things uh, just in working with um, the different uh, or the association, I was just thrilled that they got into the back end of the platform as much as they did. Um, and for them to go from, again, that first meeting I had with them in 2018, where it was like a 35, 40 minute discussion uh, and frustration about, okay, so we're doing this program, but we have no idea, is it actually accomplishing what we want to going to now, um, you know, in the one that we're running right now, the 2021, to be like, okay, yep, you offer up third, you know, $100 worth of value, but you're only having about two to three uh, redemptions. So the association is doing well um, from that particular standpoint. So I think, um, you know, again, advice, um, I would say really learn what your association needs, uh, because I will say just even listening to Lynette, um, I'm going to say the relationship that each of us has with our association is very different, even though they are smaller and they are about the same size. So I think, again, it's just really going to that partner and hearing what they want um, and figuring out whether or not, um, you know, 
to put that, uh, how you can find synergy between what you need and what they need. If I can just add one more thing, we did a, a survey. Uh, also, we did an overview, then did an individual survey, and then did some one-on-one -on -one visits because we needed to. Uh, but the survey was great because then, to back to the association, we could give like an over a comprehensive, uh, trending view of what everyone was thinking. So that was really helpful for anyone wanting to do it. It's easy and it's free. Yeah, yeah. Thank you guys both so much for that. And I think Lynette, you pointed out such a good um, thing that I talk about often with our clients, which is it's really difficult to give someone like a standard benchmark of what success looks like across our clients because every single client has a different goal or a different audience that they're trying to reach and maybe restrictions on who they can or cannot reach with that. Like you mentioned, your winery associations wanting to focus on that kind of niche audience versus blasting it out to everyone. And that's something that we run into a lot of the time here with clients. So anytime someone asks for a benchmark and I answer depends, it's not because I'm trying to be mysterious. It's just, it's so hard to give someone a clear idea of what success looks like because each of our clients has a different kind of measure of, of that success. Um, which again is why you should all tune in on December 7th to our road mapping webinar. We're going to talk a little bit about how to determine what success looks like ahead of the time ahead of your passport launches and how to build um, passports that are in line with um, those goals and um, initiatives. So um, if you don't know where to find us, go to vanwingo.com. You can find this webinar and others in our resources section. We're also on LinkedIn and Facebook, or you can feel free to reach out to me after um, the webinar. Lynette and Christina, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, your advice and your feedback was amazing. I know a lot of people are going to leave here inspired for their next passport. So thank you again so much for joining us and for sharing your success. All right. Well, I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. And we will see you next time.